this. Which, which fighter or which fight uh, do you remember that entertained you the most where you, were, you just couldn't wait for that night? Or venue, I don't know. I would probably say Rico Rodriguez. He fought for us three times. He fought for us before he became the UFC heavyweight champion. And he fought for us after he became the UFC champion. And, and I can remember the Glendale Arena the night we had 10,000 people there. And the local guy beat him by decision. I can't even Robert remember. Robert Barron. Robert Barron. Uh, and it was a good fight. And Rico came in very heavy. I think he may have been pushing 300 pounds. But uh, uh, I'm sure he didn't train for the fight. But Robert Perron, I think, fought him twice. And, oh, really? Yeah, I, I can't remember. But uh, uh, the other place he fought for us was at uh, uh, the Arizona show next to the baseball diamond. I America think. West. America West Arena, which is now named after a tribe. But I remember we Talk had to there. Yeah, yeah. You know, my favorite fight, the buildup for me was, this is an easy one for me, was uh, Edwin DeWeed versus Homer. Yes, I can remember that one too, where Edwin won by decision. And I think even in round three, he did the uh, uh, swan uh, uh, maneuver from, uh, what was that from the movie? Uh, uh, Mr. McGoggy and... Uh, uh, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember. That's the second thing that goes when you're 71. You know, John, I can remember uh, those shows when we... We knew when it was a good fight card, and we knew we were going to have a good attendance. The feeling, at least what I had, was so high that I can't explain it. But what a lot of people didn't know about me was I never drank alcohol other than the night of the event. <laughs> so people thought I was a drunk or alcoholic, but people didn't realize that that was my way of um, calming my emotions. And, and, and sometimes I think I went a little overboard, but... Uh, I never uh, knew what Roland would get at the show, whether it be one drink in beer, one drink in energy drinks. Uh, uh, I would have to case them every show to see which one I got. And the good news was I didn't have to go on the mic too much. Every once in a while I'd put the mic in my face and I would stumble over a few words. But uh, no, you, were, you were a good speaker. I mean, you did really, really well. Um, you, there was times that I wish you would have slapped me over the face and told me to stop drinking because I didn't, you know, I, I personally never really had a father figure. You were the closest one. You gave me discipline and, and I think, you know, you, you didn't want to like cross over that line. Maybe I think there was times that I was probably going a little too overboard. I think a, cu hit a couple times you checked me and you said, Roland, no more, no more beer. I was, I was a beer drinker. I didn't drink alcohol. I was a beer drinker, but it also it also worked. You know, it was. It, think about this, John. At the beginning of the show, when I used to get the crowd in it, I pull them in and I brought the guys in. My personal opinion, I don't think there's ever been a show, even then and now, that can draw that excitement that we did at the beginning. Right. We did the fighter intros where we introduced all 24 fighters and they'd rock around the cage and stand there and face the crowd one by one. And Roland would introduce them, and you could actually tell which one the fans were there to see by the applause. You right. could see, you might have a guy who had a record of 0 and 5, and he'd get a big, big uh, uh, response, and then you'd have him fighting a guy that was 5 and 0, and there would be little or no response. And I think this, this guy did that to know who the fighters were that would draw the crowd. A little bit, a little bit of that. Uh, I would also tell the crowd before the event, um, I would let them know that I'm gonna bring these guys in. Regardless if you like them or know them, please give them a response as well. And uh, I I'll never forget being on the microphone because it's really surreal. When you can see the people's faces as you talk and you bring these guys in, uh, I, I was able to videotape uh, or take pictures of, of, of people and just to see their eyes and their reactions. And there was, most of the people I would say were uh, on my side. <laughs> there are some people that would say, get off the mic and start the show. And remember what I used to say? Hey, DJ, turn off the music for a second. What'd you say? 
you better shut up. I'm going to put you in the cage and beat your ass. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. Oh, yeah. But uh, I, I did some funny things. It, I remember you used to have one or two intermissions. Because like I said, some of the fights would only last two minutes. And they wouldn't even last as long as the introductions. But we had to do at least a three-hour show, usually, so the venue could make money on food and beverage sales. And so Roland would always be lobbying for an intermission and I would be looking at the crowd, seeing whether they're into the show, not into the show, what's going on, what kind of fight card do we have, what fight's coming up that they're looking forward to. Yeah. And there were just all kinds of items. We were trying to be friendly to the venues that would hire us, and we felt a responsibility to them to make them money too. Yeah. You know what, John, I want to get back to this subject because I, I just remembered part two we were going to a subject that I thought that was, I felt important, was the support of the MMA gyms near the end and, uh, and et cetera. I, I was puzzled by it. We also had competition. We had a lot of new shows come into town that we, you were scrambling, trying to negotiate and bring them in. And it was rough. And I remember, you know, you, you, were, you were struggling a little bit. Um, you were getting a little older. You were tiring out a little bit. I think a lot of it had to do with not so much that you were getting older I don't think I think you started to feel unappreciated where all these other shows and the fighters and the coaches just whining about every little thing uh, no question about it some of these fighters or handlers they may have been legends in their own mind uh, they had an MMA record but they would never fought past the state of Arizona and they didn't understand their worth to you. And instead of lobbying us and calling us, hey, I want to fight on your show. So if I get a 3-0 record or a 5-0 record, I can go on the tough shows for UFC and keep climbing the ladder like Dominic Cruz or Justin Gaethje did. Yeah. Uh, uh, Gastelum yeah. fought for us uh, three times because he had to get another fight. He fought last weekend. Yeah, he fought last weekend. He lost in one, round one, but it was a good fight, and uh, he'll be back. I remember, I remember Henry Sedugo training at my place, and I remember him setting up the cage. He set up the raising the cage. Oh yeah, he he's got to be a millionaire several times over now, and he retired. He was smart to retire early, but he had the wrestling base, and then he added it. And he beat Demetrius Johnson for the title and uh, defended it several times. In his last fight in the UFC, he up and retired. He still had a lot of worth to the UFC, but he also has a lot of well, self-worth right now and monetary worth. Yeah, he was special. I remember rolling with him, and I, I didn't know much about him. I, I, he was in high school, and he was, I guess, a Hall State wrestler. And I felt, I can tell right away by feel, I'm thinking, wow. I felt like the atomic fleet. Um, and then, you know, and then at what I believe he went to the Colorado uh, training camp for right. Olympics. And, and he won an Olympics gold medal. And I can still remember him with a flag draped around his back, circling the bat after he won the, right. the title. I think he's the greatest combat fighter in history. Because think about it. He won the gold medal. He won two weight divisions. I mean, how can you, how, who, who? Who can match that? And then on top of that, he's never been uh, caught in a drug test. Not that he does drugs, but a lot of these guys that uh, they say are the GOAT or the greatest, well, they were caught. And I believe once you get caught on steroids, it's over. You no longer are, are in that category. And uh, so that's why, you know, I think Triple C, he's the man. Yeah, he won the weight class, like Roland said, the championship title in two separate divisions. And to do that is pretty dramatic. Yeah, I mean, we've had a lot of talent come through. I mean, we have Joe Briggs that was outstanding, beat Nick Diaz. We had Edwin DeWeese that, that, that won the future uh, champ. He was the, the uh, future champion, Franklin, that became the UFC champion. Uh, uh, Seth Belinsky, he's fought in the UFC a bunch of times. It was in the UFC reality show. I mean, I can go on and on and on on the talent that's been through through the Rage in the Cage, it's, it's actually mind-boggling. 
Right. Let me mention this. A lot of people don't know that before Strike Force was acquired by the UFC, Roland was the promoter of record for the Strike Force event that they did here. And we actually had Randy Couture come to the event, but he brought a couple fighters, and we were responsible for all the undercard. And I can't remember uh, the promoter's name was Bellator. Uh, Scott Coker. Uh, Scott Coker was there. He's a and, great guy. I like and, that. And guy. his staff was there. And Roland was a promoter of record on that show. Yeah, I mean, I had another individual that uh, that was helping me out at the time. That um, he may have had a Japanese name or. Uh, no, no, no. He was part of my staff. Okay. No, no. You're, okay. talk, you're talking about uh, Chow. He's he's the matchmaker yeah. for Bellator. Right. Uh, but I had a guy that was kind of handling the that area with with uh, strike force that wasn't too happy about where kind of created a little friction afterwards. But but other than that, it was a great 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 experience. I flew I flew out to San Jose to meet Scott Coker because uh, Rage in the Cage was possibly going to be uh, kind of like a, a branch of Strike Force. Uh, I, can't, I can't even remember the year. You remember that fighter that I had that fought, uh, Herschel Walker? Oh yeah, you went to Florida with him uh, to fight Herschel, and Herschel Walker is a real character from uh, my research on him. Uh, claimed he ate two meals a day, and uh, he, he was a pretty clean living guy. Yeah, that was that was quite a. I can't remember the fighter that fought him. <laughs> my, one of my guys. Go show you where my brain's at. You know, I don't know if it's age, but I'm starting to forget a lot of things. <laughs> Uh, well, I think he lost in the second round. I'd have to look it up again to see it. But I remember Herschel had him down. and was saying, fight back, fight back. And uh, the, the poor kid was just getting out struck by Herschel Walker. Well, John, um, it was great to see you again. Uh, it was a hell of a run. Is there anything that you want to say to the fight fans as a farewell or whatever the case is? Oh, I don't want to say farewell yet. That's right. <laughs> but, and uh, I might be back 